Lord, we thank you. We thank you that your word is alive, that it's active, that it's full of energy and it's full of power. And it contains the power to change us. And God, that's why we're here. We're here to be changed in your presence this morning. We ask that you would just anoint it in the name of Jesus. I ask, Father God, for you to just prepare the hearts to receive. Let our ears hear what it is that you're speaking to us today. And God, let us walk out of this place changed. Let it not just be another service. Let us walk out of here changed in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we have just been in a season of just... Uh, it's just been glorious to me. And I know God is moving in each and every one of your hearts, maybe in different ways. So we've hit a lot of different topics and a lot of different subjects um, recently and talking about the fear of the Lord. We've talked about the power of His presence. Um, we've talked about coming out of hiding, going into holiness. We've, we've just hit a lot of things. And, but this morning, I want to talk to you about probably um, the most uh, sensitive subject that there is that involves you as an individual. And I'm hoping that this message will open your eyes to the truth about our hearts. About our hearts. Because, you know, whether you're new to the faith or whether you've been doing great things for the kingdom of God for years, God requires all of us to have a new heart. Amen. And I, I mean, it, it is amazing to me. I mean, even be, being in ministry, um, for as long as I've been in ministry, there are seasons that I go through where I'm like, God, you need to work on my heart. <laughs> You need to work on my heart because we have a tendency to allow our hearts to become hard. We have a tendency to allow our hearts to become stubborn and calloused. And life happens and everything in life affects our hearts. And so we need to be very cautious. And so I'm going to take my time um, teaching on this because I want it to get clear down into your core of your being. But open up your Bibles, and I'm going to start with Luke 4. In Luke 4, and I'm going to read verses 16 through 22, and we'll start from here. How many of you know that you can be in church for a long, long time, and you can be touched by the presence of God and walk out unchanged? <laughs> You can be touched by the presence of God and walk out unchanged. I have experienced um, people um, over the years that had miraculous interventions from God that happened inside of their lives. People that physically had miraculous interventions of healings that should have never ever been able to happen in the natural um, I have watched people relationshiply that their marriages be put back together miraculously and God touch situations and touch people's bodies, touch their minds and literally a year later they're not, they're not changed. Wow. They're not changed. They go right back to where they came from and it's really a concern um, and we have to deal with it each of us on an individual basis because you, we, we're always coming to God, I just need a touch from God. I just need a word from God. I just need this. I just need that. But when you get what you have from God and He touches you, if your heart is not in the right condition, you will lose the very thing God touched you with. Wow. You'll lose it. You will lose it. And so our hearts are important. But Luke 4, it says, So he came to Nazareth, speaking of Jesus, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? 
See, when Jesus was in this place, it said he came to Nazareth. And that's very important for us to understand because Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. And when Jesus comes to make this public announcement to people that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, the very people in his hometown is like, wait a minute, this is Joseph's son. <laughs> wait a minute, who is he saying that he is? And I don't know about you, but when God reaches deep down into our hearts and our hearts are changed, the people closest to you will not recognize who you are. Amen. They'll know you in the natural, but they won't know you by your actions. They won't know you. Why? Because you've been more than touched by God. You've been changed by God. Amen? And so it's very important. And so I want to take a minute just to kind of give you a little history lesson of what really led up to this powerful announcement. Okay? This is like, I mean, if Jesus ever spoke more powerful words... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. I mean, He is literally telling us this is what the anointing is for. The anointing is not to give people goosebumps. That's an outward thing. You ever felt walked in and you just, whoo, I just feel the presence of God. Or somebody's talking and you'll be like, man, I feel, I, got, I call them Holy Ghost goosebumps. I got Holy Ghost goosebumps all over me because you know that God's in the room, okay? That's all external. We feel all those things on the outside. But what had happened that had led up to this powerful announcement was Jesus had not just walked into the synagogue and proclaimed who he was. Jesus had been through a process. Jesus had been in Luke 3 and 4. You're going to see what happened. Jesus had been, went to the watery grave, had been baptized by John. And once he had gotten to the watery grave, where he had to, an example to us of dying to ourselves, amen, he was then led immediately into the wilderness. Doesn't seem like a thing God would do, but he did. Because how could you be on a mountain and someone say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and two days later you're in a wilderness and the devil's tempting you with everything that he's got? Does anybody hear me this morning? You can have a touch from God. You can be in the process of being changed, and you're still going to go through your wilderness. And so 40 days and 40 nights he spends in this wilderness. And when he's in this, and I always call the wilderness, that's your process. The wilderness is not a fun place to be. Amen? But the wilderness is necessary because it's part of our process of going from when we get saved, amen, on to we progressively become more and more like Jesus. And in that wilderness, he takes us and he tempts us. Okay? Jesus went through it. We're going to go through it. And at the end of that wilderness experience... It's really beautiful because when you look at it, he was baptized at the Jordan River, okay? And it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He was filled with the Spirit right there at that Jordan River. He goes into that watery grave. He's brought up and this voice from heaven comes down. And it said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And it said the Spirit came upon him like a dove. A dove didn't come from heaven and light on his shoulder. The Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Okay? And he was filled with the Spirit. So he walks into this wilderness filled with the Spirit. Amen. Okay? And the most beautiful thing about it is, he had not been to the synagogue. He had not said anything about who he was. And he walks out of this wilderness that he had walked into filled with the Spirit. And he walks out of that wilderness filled with the power of God. Wow. And until he was filled with the power of God, he didn't go into the synagogue and start teaching. Somebody better be listening to me. If you're a preacher in the making today, you better know you may be called. And you may have been identified in your calling and your purpose. But until you go through that wilderness, until you go through that process of what God has you to do, you may be filled with His Spirit and know exactly what's going to happen in your life. But until you have been through your process, you're not got power. <laughs> and you need power to be able to minister and to be able to stand and do what it is that God's called you to do. Can anyone say, I'm in the wilderness? Yeah. 
I am in the wilderness. Woo! I'm telling you what. And so here he had been to the Jordan to be baptized. The heavens are opened up. And, and it's amazing because... I think this is so crazy when you, when you backtrack and you're like, where are you going? Trust me. Just remember the heart. The heart. Here Jesus is. He goes to a watery grave. Okay? When we go into a watery grave of baptism, what does that mean? That means that we are the old man is being put, in, put to death. So we've got to die to ourselves. The old man of who we were has got to be put in that grave. And it's not a dirt grave, it's a watery grave. Why is it a watery grave? Because it's washing everything away. It's washing all the old away. It is symbolic. When you are baptized, it's not a ritual, it's a symbol of you dying to yourself and raising up. Don't you think it's funny that here is this sinless man that, ha that was baptized? From what? <laughs> From what? He was sinless. You, he, didn't, he didn't have an old man. But it was done as an example to us of what we had to do in our lives. Amen? He had a death to himself. The Father required a death to self from a sinless man. And if a sinless man was required to die to himself, why are we fussing and fighting about dying to ourselves? So, if you stop dying, you stop developing. Wow. And so here is his process. He's dying to himself. And as he had to continue to die to himself, it didn't just stop at the watery grave. It didn't just stop at the place where it said, this is my beloved son. It didn't just stop the day you said, I'm saved now and I belong to Jesus. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. It goes on. And we got to continue to die to ourselves. Amen? And so, here we are, and we look at, back to what I said at the beginning. Is it possible to see a miracle and not change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it possible to see blind eyes open and not change? Absolutely. Why? Because we have to go through the process of continuing to die to ourselves because God is after something from you. God wants something from you. Amen? And so here he is. He came, when he came out of the wilderness, he came out with power. And when he, was, when he went in, he was filled. But when he came out, he was filled with power. And it was then that he entered into the synagogue and he began to take his place. And as his ministry began at that moment. Amen? And so what happens was, we know Jesus, he was Jewish. He was raised in Jewish culture. Amen. And so he had a total understanding of what it was to go into the synagogue. Now, when he's in this synagogue, particularly, he's in the synagogue in his hometown. It basically said he had been to other synagogues and he was being glorified for what he was doing in the other places. But when he got close to home... There was no longer, no more glory on what it is that Jesus is beginning to speak. Now it's like it's just Joseph's son? Joseph's son? Who is he to stand up? Who is he? I know all about him. That's the carpenter. I mean, okay, this is where we hit in life. We get saved. We start, go through our wilderness experience. We begin to step into our calling and step into what God has us to do. And immediately, those closest to you are the very ones that do not see the anointing. My, you know, my husband doesn't see me glow. I'm just sorry right now. I don't see my husband glow. You know why? Because when it's, those of their own enemies of our own households are what we have to watch for. Okay, why? Is it because they don't see the anointing on you? No, they're familiar with you. They know you in the flesh. Amen? And so they know you. But here is Jesus, and he's at this place. And so Jesus, as a Jew, raised in the synagogue. And let, let me just stop and say this. In those days, there was the synagogue and there was the temple. They were not the same thing. The synagogue and the temple were two different things. The temple was where they worshipped. 
The synagogue was where they were taught. And it was a place of debate. Because how many of you know, the Pharisees were there, the Sadducees were there, all their different theologies would come to the synagogue. And they would stand up to read the scripture. And as they would read the scripture, whoever's turn it was to read the scripture, that person would then sit down in what they called the seat of Moses, the place of honor in the house. And that person that read the scripture would then begin to expound what their interpretation of that scripture was. Okay? So the synagogue and the temple was not the same thing. So this was a place that... There was a lot of debate. There was a lot of different schools. We would say it like this today. There was Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Charismatics. There was all these people that gathered together in this synagogue to say whose theology is correct. Amen? And we won't even go there today. Hallelujah. But as he was reading, they hand him the scroll to read, and it just happens to be Isaiah 61. Okay, Isaiah 61. And we're not going to go back and read that, but if you go back, you're going to find in Isaiah 61 the same thing we just read in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Yes. And so we hear again the same prophetic word that had been given in Isaiah. Now it's Jesus' turn in his hometown to take up the scroll and to read from the book. And that's why it said he stood up to read and he sat down. He sat down to explain. He sat down to explain to them. And they're standing there like, this is Joseph's son. This is Joseph's son. So it was really, really powerful what was going on at this moment. And it's really interesting, just from a historical standpoint, that if you study prophecy very much, there were two things in Isaiah 61 that was, was not, Jesus did not repeat in Luke 4. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever went to the Old Testament, you'd be like, okay, there's the prophetic word, but we go over here and we see it in the New Testament, and it's, there's one word changed, or something left out, and you'll be like, well, you know, that word just contradicts itself. It really doesn't. Because if you understood the Jewish culture and what they would do, when they would, when they would talk about the Bible, when they would talk about the law or anything, they would, it, was, it was common practice for them to piece things and link things together that they knew of from the law and from different prophetic words. They would put it together and it was not anything that was misinterpreted. They just knew how to link together things like that. And so what happened when Jesus went in and he picks up Isaiah, when he's reading in the book of Isaiah, we see in Isaiah that there's another piece that Jesus left out. And in Isaiah 62, it talks about the day of the vengeance of our Lord. And when Jesus spoke it in the synagogue, he did not read the day of the vengeance of our God. Wow. Why? Because he was the word, and that word, it wasn't time yet. The day of the vengeance of our God has not arrived yet. So Jesus himself didn't even stand up and say, the day of the vengeance of the Lord has arrived. He didn't say that. Why? Because he understood that we are in a dispensation of grace. Okay? It also did not talk about releasing those that were oppressed. He, he includes oppression because in Isaiah 61, that was all reference to the year of Jubilee when the slaves were set free and they were exiled and able to be brought back to their lands. Does that make sense? So here is Jesus, and he's standing up, and he's speaking these powerful words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Not the day of vengeance. The acceptable year of the Lord. I want you to take notice this morning. The first part of the anointing Jesus spoke about 
was he went straight to the heart. He said, I come to heal the brokenhearted. I come to heal the brokenhearted. I come to deal with your heart. Because from the beginning of time, the enemy of our soul has waged this silent war against your heart. He's not fighting against your marriage. He's fighting for your heart. He's not fighting against you with your kids. He's fighting you with your heart. It is a silent war that takes on all kind of faces and all kind of circumstances. But what he wants is your heart. It's not about your finances. It's about your heart. People want to argue tithes and offerings. It's about your heart. What does your heart say amen and it's like the devil don't care how much money you got in fact the devil will give you all the money he wants to if he can keep you out of the will of God he don't have a problem with money he'll take it from you and he'll pile it on you what is he after when he would speak to the rich people what was he after he wasn't telling them go give everything you have and give it to the poor he could have fed the poor he knew how to multiply fish he knew how to feed the multitudes but when he's dealing with the rich man he is dealing with the heart I want you to get to the matter that's in your heart when his presence comes into the room he wants your heart you don't have to worry about everything that's going on in your life. You don't have to worry about all the external stuff that's going on. There is a war, people, and it is for your heart. He wants you to get hard. He wants you to get mad. He wants you to get sad. He wants you to get depressed. He wants you to have unbelief. He wants you stubborn. He wants you calloused. He wants to do whatever it takes to pull you out. Why? Because... God, when he has your heart, he has you. When he has your heart, he has you. That sounds so simple. I don't know about you, but it's not easy. It's not easy to live. Because we've got to take care of our hearts. And as we're in this season of revival and his presence and just everybody I mean there's just people are getting free it's like you know it doesn't just go on here in the service I mean I'm hearing all kind of just beautiful reports amen of people that are they're pouring their hearts out to God and really trying to get this thing right and so but at the same thing we have to understand that it's our heart yes. that he's after yes. Lord I give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. He's coming after our hearts. Why? Because everything in your life begins in your heart. Everything in your life begins in your heart. How many times have we heard, oh, just follow your heart? Dumb advice. That's dumb advice. Follow God. Follow God. Why would you say that? Because the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Don't tell someone to follow their heart. Tell them to follow Jesus. Tell them to follow what's in the Word. Because we take the heart as the things we feel. Well, I just don't feel like being married anymore. I just don't feel like raising kids anymore. I just don't feel like praying. I just don't feel like going to church this morning. we got all kinds of things. If we follow our heart, it's going to lead us all the way to hell. Amen. Seriously. Don't listen to your heart. Listen to the Lord. Listen to the voice that's at the very core of your being. Amen? You can't trust your heart unless Jesus has it all. Amen. And the whole process that we're walking through in life is to give it all to Him. And you say, well, I've already gave Him all. Have you? Have you? Because that's the examination we're doing this morning. Have we given Him every matter? Everything that concerns us, have we given it to Him? Have we given it to Him, really? Are we hanging on to any little thing in the little corner 
right down here in the little bottom chamber of your heart where you think nobody's there. It has to start in the heart. God can't start anywhere else. Listen to me. He cannot start anywhere else. He goes for the heart. Why? Because it's the center of everything we do. Come on. Our heart in its natural bodily function is the center of life. It pumps stuff all throughout our bodies. Without our heart, we are dead. It has to start in the heart. If you don't have this revelation, listen to me carefully. If you don't have the revelation of it going to your heart, if you don't have that revelation, all you're ever looking for is an external God. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. God on everything around me. God fix this. God do this. God, I don't know why you didn't do this. God this. God that. God this. Everything external has got to be fixed. Wow. <clears throat> and if you don't have the revelation of God changing your heart, every time you pray, it's going to be for things. It's going to be for stuff. It's going to be for messes that you need fixed. <laughs> How many of you... I mean, I, I spent about... Mm, I'm going to say a year and a half praying for God over a situation that it took a year and a half for God to say, hey, guess what? I'm not changing them. I want you to change. I'm a little slow. It took me a while. Year and a half. Year and a half praying over the same situation over and over and over and over and over again. And one day God comes and says, what about you? What about your heart? Amen. I've been doing this recently. What about your heart? Karen, what about your heart? What about your heart? And I'd be like, ooh, that's a question. <laughs> and you know about me and God and questions. <laughs> that tells me if he asks me a question, he's got something to say that I don't know yet, <laughs> but that I'm going to have to own before that conversation is over with. <laughs> what about your heart? So we start examining things. But the first part of the anointing of God that Jesus announced was that he come to heal the brokenhearted. See, every revival that's ever hit in America started in the right place. What? It started with God going for the heart. Why? Because if he can put one straight to your heart, you'll die to self. You'll be a dead man. Because if he has your whole heart, then your old ways can't survive because they're dead. Amen. And now it's in him you live and move and have your very being, as I've been shouting from the housetops recently. Amen. So there's a revival that's coming. But it's a revival of heart. Yes. Wow. It's hearts getting right. It's not about filling buildings. It's about hearts. It's about God going for the heart of the matter. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, you all know this scripture. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you got saved. You confessed it with your mouth. You believed it in your heart. You didn't just confess it with your mouth and have a little bit of doubt. You believed it with your whole heart and you confessed it with your mouth that you were saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. It doesn't say with the head. It doesn't say with the head, you think you're right with God. It says with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, Confession is made unto salvation. See, you have to believe it in your heart before you confess it. You have to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That he died for your sins. You have to believe that with everything on the inside of you. Why? Because when you get done praying that prayer, 
You know, he didn't come down here and do it all over again for you so you could see it in real time. You have to believe it. And the problem that I believe that is becoming very prevalent today, and I've said it over and over again, but I want you to hear it because we have to guard our hearts. We have faith teaching after faith teaching after faith teaching, but we have a nation that's not revived. Amen. What's the problem? Somebody needs to address it. Yes. The nation's not revived. Good teaching. Nothing wrong with faith. But there's a misconception in it. Because faith doesn't work if it's just in your head. Wow, that's good. Faith has to be in your heart. It has to be in your heart. You can't just positively think something. Do you know when you go to counseling, and I've shared this in the last couple weeks, when you go into counseling and you're with a secular counselor, you're getting all kind of knowledge on how to fix your problem. They've studied man. They have degrees of how human beings work. So they can counsel you and give you head knowledge all day long, but they lack the anointing to change the heart of the situation. And the church hasn't dealt with it because the people in the church are running to the world trying to get help. Because the anointing to heal the brokenhearted has not been where it needs to be in the house of God. Why? Because we got heart issues. If it's not in your heart, it's a mental exercise. It is the power of positive thinking. Powerful, positive confession. Do I believe in confession? Yes, I do. But I want to know what's in my heart before I say it. I know all kind of people that walk around all day long. By his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. It says, in first, by his stripes I'm healed. And they don't no more believe it than the man in the moon. Did you say, how are you doing today? I'm sick. <laughs> now, if you ask me how I'm doing today, and I am sick, I'm going to tell you, I'm believing God that I'm the healed of the Lord today. I'm going to watch what I say. I'm going to watch how I say it. I'm not going to deny the facts of what's going on. Because that's just ridiculousness. Because somebody cared enough to say, how are you doing? And then when you say, I'm sick, then you're going to give them a five-hour dissertation on the scripture that just tore them up worse than they already were. Now they're bleeding and sick. Because it's got to be in the heart. What do they believe in their heart? It doesn't work if it's coming from the wrong place. If your faith is coming from your head, and that's the problem today, because this world is all about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. What can I know? What can I know? What can I know? Let's go back. Let's go back to our grandmas. Let's go back to our great grandmas. They didn't know nothing. All they knew was they could stand up and sing a song. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I just got a feeling. I just know God's going to take care of this. They couldn't preach a message. They couldn't give you their theology. They just believed in their heart that God was going to move and in childlike faith he moved for them but now we become so knowledgeable and so we got the puff head devil our heads are so puffed up we're so full of theology we think we know everything and we got heart issues but you don't know what I know so how are you going to get healed that's a heart issue it's a heart issue when was the last time you looked at your heart? Because it has to come from the heart before you confess it. Before you see it, before you have it. If it's not working, it's because nobody's addressing it. We can go back to the faith scripture, Mark 11, 22 through 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I say all the time, we've changed that. We say have faith in our faith. Not have faith in God. Because to have faith in God, you've got to believe in your heart. To have faith in faith, you just got to know what faith teaching. Who you following. But in your heart of hearts, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And does not what? Doubt in his heart. 
but believes those things in his heart. Believing what he says in his heart. He'll have whatever he says. See, God doesn't have a problem with giving us everything we want, but we have a problem giving God our heart. Amen. We have a problem believing God with all our heart. Amen. We get hard. We let unbelief come in. We let external circumstances around us dictate everything that's going on in our lives. It's not the way you do it. Do we want revival? Yes. Or do we just want a touch from God? Because we can get the touch and not be changed. Do you just want God to fix the external things that are going on that's got you all in a tizzy? Or do you want your heart changed? Amen. Do you want your heart changed? Because once He gets your heart, none of those external circumstances are going to move you. Amen to that. It's not going to move you. Why? Because you know that you know that you know that you know that you know. You got that right. Kevin Neal used to make a statement all the time years ago talking about our heart. He said we got lies in the head and issues in the heart. Lies in the head, issues in the heart. We're being lied to. We're being lied to. Read your Bible. He's after one thing. Your heart. You know why unforgiveness is such a big deal? Because it's a heart issue. My husband writes a book. He gets published. We went on Sid Roth program. After that, I went in one day. I threw the book down on the kitchen table. I said, send them all back. I am done. I had never had so many situations to walk in forgiveness as I had after that book was released. I'm like, pack it up and send it back. Because I don't want to forgive one more person. I'm done. I am just done forgiving people. And then I go back to remembering when he wrote the book. And I said, what are you writing a book on? He said, the power of forgiveness. And I'm like, well, what in the world are you writing a book on that for? Everybody knows you've got to forgive people. Duh. <laughs> you will reap the things that come out of your mouth. Amen? If it doesn't go into the heart, it's not a change. It's performance. Listen to me. If it doesn't go into your heart, it's not change. It's performance. If you're just going through the motions, it's performance. It's behavior modification. It's not heart transformation. We have all kinds of church motivational speakers trying to behavior modify you to look like little good Christians and no one's saying in our hearts we're hard, forgive us Lord. In our hearts we have unbelief God, get it out of us God. We are not dealing with our heart issues. Right. Revival begins with the revelation of the indwelling presence of God in you. He's in you. In Corinthians it says, don't you know? Don't you know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know? Don't you know what's in your heart? See, He wants to sit on the throne of our hearts. He wants to be on the inside of us. He wants you to know He's in there. He wants you to know it. And He wants you to know He doesn't want to just come and go like a renter. Mm -hmm. Moves in on Sunday mornings, moves out on Friday night. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Isaiah 57, 17, we've read it recently. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who what? Has a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. What is he saying? I want to come and live in a holy place. I want you to walk in humility. I want the brokenness of heart to be there so I can live in you. Because to the extent He lives in you is the measure 
of your anointing is the measure of how much of Christ you have on the inside of you, working out of you. He's got to be in there. Not just talking about him. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Boy, don't that sound spiritual. Strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell where? In your heart through faith. In your heart through faith. See, it has to be in your heart first. Faith works through your heart. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Why do I say that? Where's the dwelling place for God on this earth right now? Where does He dwell? Inside of us. He wants to be seated on the throne of our hearts. It's where His presence wants to stay. He comes corporately. He comes corporately. And he fills us with his presence. So that all can be touched. But when he comes corporately, not all is changed. Only those that he has their heart. Amen? When things don't happen like we think they should. When you feel like God let you down. When God didn't come through like you thought he should have. What is going on? We're looking and depending on external things of God's activity, not internal knowings. When you walk through hard times and you cannot explain why God didn't do what you thought He was going to do, you're going to find out at that moment what your heart condition is. Do you still believe Do you still believe when you have wayward kids, when you see little children that die of terminal diseases, and you're like, where's God in all of this? Can you believe in your heart that no matter what the external circumstance is, that He's still God and you have a knowing that it doesn't matter though you slay me, yet I'm going to serve you? I know what the Word says. I know what my faith books talk. I know what I believe in my heart. But when I don't get what I want, when on the external things get ugly, am I still going to be stand believing or am I going to be throwing a tizzy because God didn't do what I thought He was going to do? Because after all, I spoke the Word. I prayed. I fasted. Shame on us. Repent of our pride. He's God and we're not. And am I going to take away from the faith message? No. You keep believing. You keep confessing. You get that word down in your heart. Not in your head. I'd rather have one verse from the Bible in my heart than 15 verses in my head. And that's why I always tell people, get your word from God. What is a word from God? It's not just any word. It's the word that you feel God breathed on, that he tattooed it on your heart for that situation. What are those verses that he has tattooed on your heart? Early on I had one. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in the darkness, the Lord will be my light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord until He comes and shines His light on me. That is tattooed on my heart because I know even when I mess up, even if everybody would turn against me, no matter how dark this world got, I know, I know, hey, I'll bear it up. I know what God's woodshed is. It is not a fun place to be. But I'm not blaming anybody else but me. And there I sit. But I know that when I've fallen, I'm going to get back up. Why? Because I know who my God is. God is. I know that is in my heart. You're not taking him out of my heart. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It don't matter if everything in my life looks like it's failed. It doesn't matter who turns away, who likes me, who don't like me. I'm going to stand and I'm going to say, as for me, I will stand. And it doesn't say if I fall. It says when I fall. Because I know But for the grace of God, amen, Amen. even the very elect are going to fall. Amen. Heart. A word tattooed on your heart. 
No one can take that away from you. No one can take away a word I got over here by this wall one day, 30 years ago, 20 some years ago, that literally God came down and spoke to me, fear not, stand still, see the salvation of your God for the enemy you see today. You will see him no more forever. I was set free that day by the power of a word that I took a hold of in my heart and I believed it. Did warfare ever come after that? Did the past ever come to chase me? Guess what? It still shows up. But I can go right back to that wall when I'm praying and I can say, I made a memorial right here. I built an altar right here. And I know I don't have to fear. I can stand still because God's for me and He's not against me. And you want to pass, chase me with my past? Have fun because you go wear yourself plumb out. Because I know who I am. And I know when God said, Go forward, He has taken care of everything that's on the back side of me. Why? Can I get emotional when stuff happens? I am woman, hear me cry. Can external things get to me? Just as fast as they can get to you. We anointed to preach it, we got to live it just like everybody else. Amen? But there are those things that you know that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. They, you just know. And nothing externally can shake that. Shoo. Can I give you, oh, can you, I, I'm going to give you something. If you're really spiritual, how many of you just say, man, I just want to hear God. I just, I just want to hear God. How many of you now say, I want to hear Him audibly. I want to hear Him audibly. Do you know the audible voice of God is external? Wow. Wow. The audible voice of God is external. Wow. And you know what? I've heard His audible voice not very many times, but a couple times. And dude, it'll, it'll cause you to shake. It'll cause you to fall on your face. You talk about the fear of the Lord. Let Him speak to you audibly. And it's powerful, and I'm not taking away from that. It is powerful, but, it's, but it is external. Because the voice of God that you hear continually is inside. Wow. It's an internal voice. Wow. It speaks deep in the heart. Yeah. Have you ever been in those situations? God, just come down and... <laughs> I used to tell God, you know, come down and just let the spirit of the slap come all over you. Get that situation taken care of. This is nuts. Yeah. Come on. You, you know what I'm talking about. You just get... The voice of God that you will hear continually is that internal voice. Come on. And you know why you can't hear it? Because your heart's stopped up and cluttered. Your heart don't have clean ears to hear. Because you got all this stuff rumbling around on the inside of you. Luke 6.45 says, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What am I saying today? There is, in real time, something that happens between your heart and your mouth. It is synchronized. Someone say, oh, no, 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 that's really not true. That's really not true. Oh, tell that to God. <laughs> this is out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Amen. <laughs> well, I didn't really mean that. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Can we just own it and deal with it? Amen. Can we just take ownership and say, Amen. I don't think in my head I meant to say that, but in my heart, obviously there's something there that me and God need to deal with. Because they're synchronized. I didn't write this. <laughs> I would have wrote it different. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth 
speaks. Good treasures and evil treasures. What's a treasure? It's something that is very valuable to you and it's put aside in a little trunk called your heart. Yep, come on. Okay, married couples, right now. You know that little thing you buried down in there in that little treasure box? And when he starts or when she starts, you're going to bring that thing up no matter what. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring up something that happened 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you, the woman, the man stand there like that, I don't even remember what you're talking about, and you just created a forest fire. Don't ever say you don't remember that happening. Men, don't do it. Just stay quiet. Don't say you don't remember because you're about to relive a chapter in an old time frame of your marriage that you probably don't want to revisit. Am I right? Am I talking to anybody here? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Everything you say, good or bad, is coming from some part of your heart. Everything. Everything. Now, the enemy's goal in this season right now we're in. Listen to me. I want you not to look at any circumstances that you're going through right now. Because I know where God be blessing, the devil be messing. Don't ever forget that. Where God be blessing, the devil be messing. He will show up on your doorstep. He is not going to let you take ground for the kingdom of God and not contend for it. He is not going to do it. He's never done it. It's not his style. He may sit back and wait and let you think you have arrived only to show up and you take a big fall. But the enemy's goal is to take your heart captive. Why? Because he knows it's the center of your life. He knows it's the throne that he wants to ascend to. Do you remember when they described him in Ezekiel? And I said, I will ascend into the heavens. I will sit on the throne. Guess what he wants from you? He wants to take the throne captive. He wants to sit on the throne of your heart. Hit the road, Jack, G.G. says. Don't come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Proverbs 4.23. In the NIV Bible, it says, Above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Why is this necessary? Because your heart is extremely valuable. Why do you guard something? Let me just say it this way. Once a week you set out trash. Okay? Garbage. And if you live in town, you take the garbage cans and you take them out to the street. Right? And you set them there. Why? Because it's trash. Do you sit there and guard that trash all night till they come pick it up next morning? That's good. You don't, do you? Why? Because it's trash. It doesn't have any value. So you don't worry about guarding something that doesn't have any value. But our heart has value to God. And so we're called to guard it. Guard it. That's why Solomon said, above all else, no matter what you do, what you're going through in your life, guard your heart. He doesn't say, hey, if you get around to it, you might want to check your heart out. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that at all. You know, it'd be nice, church, if you'd guard your hearts. He didn't say that. He said, above everything else, guard your heart. Amen. Why? Because it's the center. It's the center of life. It's that throne that he wants to sit upon. Your heart overflows into thoughts and words and actions. Your heart goes up and connects with your mind and you do things. Some things you wish you wouldn't have done. But if it comes out of the wellspring of life and then it connects with the head. See, we're trying to get it from here to here. And God said, you got to get it from here to here. You can't just learn it. It's not a textbook. 
It's a relationship of intimacy and trust. Andy's going to be working. He's working on a message on trust. It's a place. What is trust? It's that, that thing inside of your heart. Wow. Why? Because your heart is under constant attack. When he says guard your heart, he's implying that you're living in a combat zone. Wow. Guard, military word. Be prepared. The enemy's coming sooner than later. Amen. He's coming, I'm telling you. Listen to me. He's coming. And when he shows up, he's not going to come and say, I'm here to attack your heart today. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to come through your spouses. He's going to come through your kids. He's going to come through your finances. He's going to come. He's going to come through your marriage. He's going to come in a way you don't recognize him. Because why? He wants that throne back. Because we're selling all out to God. He wants that throne back. Wow. Ever had any casualties from that war? The The... Demonic realm has its own language. It really does. Because we know that in the scripture, the spirit always leads. But the demonic language drives. Drives. Something's driving you. Case in point, I just got to get this off my chest, Gigi. <laughs> Go ahead. What does that mean? I'm being driven to speak that thing out. Shut it down. Don't talk. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Because it has a language. You know, as I went on my weight loss adventure, one of the things when I was finished was, okay, now how do I maintain? And I, I, I because I'm... It, I guess you could all figure it out. I'm all or nothing. That's my personality. I'm all in. Not, you know, I could never sew, Cindy. You know why? Because the minute I started that pattern, if the hem wasn't put in it and it was done by morning, I would just go to pieces because once I start something, I finish it. I want it done right then. I don't, want, I don't like process. I just, just do it. I'm all in or I'm all out. If, 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 there's, if there's Oreos in front of me, it's the whole roll. <laughs> Uh uh. Not two, not three, it's the whole roll. Okay, Girl Scout cookies. I saw them out yesterday. I passed by that table. I said, in the name of Jesus, I will not eat that sleeve of thin mints. I will not do it. I won't do it. And I walk by Sam's Club, and underneath my breath, I said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And that poor little Girl Scout was probably sitting there like, What is her problem? No, I didn't really do that. But that's what. Oh my But as I went into that process, the Lord gave me a strategy. And he said to me, because, I mean, I, I, mean, I wanted to eat some fun things. <laughs> something in life that was enjoyable. <laughs> Just give me something. <laughs> Just a little bit of sugar. A little tiny bit of sugar. And so he gave me a strategy. And he said to me, he said, ask yourself a question. When you see that sweet thing, say to yourself, do I have to have it? Wow. And if the answer is yes, I have to have it, walk away. Why? Because it's the language of another realm. Wow. Yeah. wow. And when I see that piece of sugar on a plate, and it's like, do you have to have it? And I say, no, not really. I have permission to eat it. It's that simple. Wow. It was that simple for me. Why? Because the demonic realm has a language that drives you. You go through McDonald's. It drives you to biggie size it. Drives you to biggie size. Yes. One hamburger wasn't enough. I want a double cheeseburger. And... Now we triple cheeseburger. We got the 
mega baconator or whatever that thing is. It couldn't get in your mouth. It'd take you two months to eat that thing. I can't get my mouth open that wide, and I got the biggest mouth in here. Why? Because it drives us. It drives us. And it's been, I mean, it's been a revelation to me after all these years to literally sit and say, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll pass it up or not pass it up. If I can't, if I can't, if I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, no. Slow down. Put a lid on it. Throw it in the trash. Set it outside and don't guard it. See, I used to guard those Oreos. Because they were valuable to me. No kidding. I mean, this is no kidding. I mean, people talk about drug addict. I was, a, I was an Oreo addict and put Diet Pepsi on top of that. We're done. I mean, I used to go in restaurants. My husband would say, look, just, just she's an IV drinker. Just keep bringing the Diet Pepsi. Keep filling them up because she's not going to. She'll have four or five. And I, I, would, I would just drink. drink. I, would have been, I would have been a dead addict had I ever done drugs. I'm serious right now. I would have. I would have done drugs till I die because I never had anything that would tell me when to stop. It was that compulsive, you know what I'm saying? <sighs> Why am I going there? Because I had to deal with my heart. I had to deal with my heart. <sighs> anything that doesn't originate from the heart is never real. It'll never last. The only relationships that last in your life are those that began in the heart. See, you can have all kind of issues in your marriages, but when you give that heart away to someone, you'll get through all that. But it's when you kept that one piece of your heart you wouldn't let them have. You can't get through it then. There's that one piece I won't let you have. Mostly because... I was hurt there once before. I was wounded in that area once before. And what happens is, there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded animal, and that includes humans. Wow. <laughs> Amen. That's good. There's nothing more dangerous than ministers that are wounded that never got healed because they preach from their pain and not from their victory. Yeah, come on now. Dangerous. Why? Because the heart, the heart, Jesus said the anointing of God comes to heal the broken hearted. When your heart is changed, you don't have to be reminded what not to do. When your heart changes, you don't have to have a reminder Amen. to modify your behavior. Because your heart changes. And it's no longer anything that you have to set boundaries on. People get free from drugs. They get saved on fire for God. And they want to bring every drug addict out of their dens. And they want to go right back into that mess. Wow. They give their hearts to God. They get filled with the Spirit but they never went through the wilderness experience of their process. And so therefore they have no power. They're filled with the Spirit, but they don't have the power working through them yet. So they go back into those drug dens, and it isn't long before you're burying them too. <laughs> Anything that doesn't originate from the heart is never real, and it will never last. The anointing of God cannot, listen to me, cannot bypass your heart. It can't. It has to heal the brokenhearted. It has to deal with the heart. It has to come first, and then it affects the rest of your life. You know what? All sin is not from your head. Sin is from your heart. Sin is from your heart. You can repent from your head and nothing change. Because you didn't repent from your heart. What does that mean? I repent for the external things that have happened around me. 
that I haven't repented for the internal turmoil that was in my heart that caused the external things to happen. Wow. So the heart has to be dealt with before we can deal with external things that are all around us. What do you mean by that? Judas was there when the water was turned into wine. Mm -hmm. Judas was there when the 5,000 were fed. Judas was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Judas had been touched by the miracles of God, but he wasn't changed. Because wow. he had a heart issue. He had a heart issue. And Jesus knew it. And Jesus didn't throw him away. Je you think Jesus didn't know the whole time what Judas was going to do? He knew exactly what was going to happen. Because he knew the heart. How much of your heart God has in your life determines the measure of the spirit that you carry. Oh. The heart is where intimacy begins. See, when you marry someone, you give them your heart. You sell all out to them with your heart. And that's why divorce is so painful. Because you gave your heart away. That's good. You didn't give your head away. Well, the only way you gave your head away is if you just married him for their money. <laughs> or you married him for some reason other than love. But when love comes, you give your heart away. Wow, that's good. And that's why the easiest people to hurt you are those of your own household. Why? Because you gave your heart away. That's why when your kids do things they shouldn't do, as a mama, you carried them close to your heart. You gave your heart away. It's hard. Blended families is hard. Because you always have that one parent that they weren't conceived in their heart. And you can't, you have to ask for supernatural grace and supernatural love. It's a supernatural thing for a blended family to make it. Amen. Because it's just natural when they're yours. But it's supernatural when it's somebody else's. Wow. And you've got to learn to give your heart away. You remember in the Bible it says, Lord, Lord, many. Many, many, many. We're going to say, God, I did this. God, I cast out devils. God, I did this. And the Lord's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, you mean you can cast out devils and have a heart issue? Absolutely. Absolutely. You cast them out, and Jesus said, I never knew you. Why? Because the word knew is a word that means intimacy. Wow. It's intimacy. <laughs> I know you've probably heard it before, but if you break the word intimacy down, it means intimacy. Wow. That's why stuff can be so painful. So the heart's complex, isn't it? The heart's very, very complex. And I'm going to stop there today because I don't want to throw too much. But I believe that the Lord, in this season, as we seek His presence and the power of Him to change us, don't just be looking for external things to change. Look for the heart. The heart. Let the revelation of who you are be in my heart and not in my head. Let it be in my heart and not in my head. Jesus, I want to believe in my heart. Whew. Not just in my head. I don't want it to be a mental exercise to come in and to come into your presence. I want it to be a heart that comes running and a heart that comes chasing after you. Because that's all He wants. Because if He has your heart, 
He has you. All of you. And once he has all of us, then he works on us. And it's not near as painful. Oh yeah, we're always dying to self. <laughs> we're always in that continual process of dying. But when he has all of our heart, there's nothing to run back to. Amen. There's nothing to run back to. So many things are just preached wrong. Not because someone intended to, but because we've forgotten it's about the heart. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. What's that? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Have your way, God. Have your way. Drive out unbelief. Drive out hardness of heart. Get all of those calluses, all of those hurts, and all of those pains. All of those wounds from when I can't trust anymore because of all the pain that I've been through. God, I just pray right now, I'll be enthroned on my heart once again. Take your place and indwell inside of me. Be the center of it all. Be my all in all. Be the reason that I'm here, Father God. And from that place, work it out. Work it out. Let your revelation come into my heart, not into my head. Let it be deep on the inside of the core of my being. That if I lose everything, God, I have you. And I believe in you. When I say I believe it, I want to mean it. I just don't want to go through the exercise. When I say I believe it, I want to mean it. I believe you, Lord. I take you at your word, Lord. I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, God. I want a relationship with you, God. I want it to be more than religion. I don't need religion. I need you. I need you to come when nobody's around. I need you to be there, Father God, when I don't know what to do. I need you to be there when I'm hurting. I need you to be there when I'm afraid. Yes, Lord. And I want to turn inward to where you're enthroned, where you inhabit my praise. That if I don't have the instruments and I don't have the voice, whatever it means, I can turn inward and I can praise you with everything on the inside of me because you're seated on the throne of my heart. I can whisper to you my worship and you hear me because you're inside right by my heart. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I want to believe you more and more and more. Just deliver me from unbelief and hardness and stubbornness. Get all those calluses away, all those putrefying sores. Father, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Because change begins when we surrender yeah. our hearts. Not our head, our heart. The head will follow. So let's be careful that we don't take our word and our study time and just use it as a mental exercise. And know this, it takes time. You don't put a band-aid on a heart attack. Amen. When the hearts come under attack, you can't put a band-aid on it. That's not how it's fixed. Amen. Stand to your feet today. Mm -mm -mm. I give you my heart. I give you my heart. I give you my heart. Thank you. Oh.
any part of you that is not surrendered to Him. He loves you so much. Yes. He loves you so much. Once again, in Jesus' name.